Oh. is actually extensible messaging and presence protocol. So it's basically a chat protocol. So which was like developed in like around 2002, around 2002. So it has evolved over the time. So it has been backend for Google Talk, earlier Google Talk. Even WhatsApp uses customized version of XMPP. So, <coughs> so XMPP mainly uses XML as a payload. XML as the payload. So, um, what? No, they no, it's not there. Okay. So XML as the main payload. So. First about the architecture of the XMPP. So XMPP is actually a distributed client server. Uh, follows the distributed client server architecture. So wherein the server is connected by the multiple clients. C1, C2, C3. So a server may also be connected to the another XMPP server. So in this, each client node is identified by a unique ID known as JID. So the JID is nothing but Jabbar ID. So say the server's domain name is say local example.com. So client one at example.com will have a JID of C1 at the rate example.com. So similarly, C2 will have C2 at example.com. So it is somewhat similar to that of email ID or something. So JID uh, is used primarily for communicating. Say C1 wants to send some message or information to C2. So it will take the JID of C2 and then it will send message to the server and server will then route the message to the C2. So this is the basic high level thing. So similarly, uh, if there are two XMPP servers, then they can communicate with each other. So that is also defined by the XMPP's uh, Jabber server protocol. So the connection between two servers, it is uh, basically subjected to the uh, agreed policies upon the two servers. Say you might have seen like uh, some of your enterprise chat application can communicate over GTalk and etc. So that is because of the XMPP back backend. So this is the high level information about the architecture. So. Can I just repeat? Please don't mind. Yeah. Please. Yeah. So <coughs> basically, the XMPP follows distributed client server architecture. So wherein server is at the center, and clients connect to the server. So generally, each client will have a, not generally, always each client will would be identified by JID. So JID is Jabber ID. So Jabber ID will have a local part, so that is client name, and a domain part, which is the server name. So a server can be also be connected to another server. So it is subjected to the agreement between the two servers. So <coughs> if the two servers are actually uh, can communicate with each other. Say server S2 has a client, say C3, which is identified by C3 at, say this is example.net. Then a C1 can send message to C3, which is at example.net. So generally, you might have seen the same in your enterprise app chat application, where you can send the messages to um, GTalk and other places. So this is about the high level architecture. So somewhat similar like this, what I told you. Initiating entity. So any client server communication starts with the XML streams. So XML streams are nothing but the XML payload which starts with stream. So initially, 
say that this is the server so this is the client so client sends server first an xml payload stream and server also returns the client a stream so this is the initial handshake which happens in the xmpp protocol so this uh, communication happens over plain tcp at the initial stage so once uh, once the client gets the stream from the server so basically like you can think of it as a stream has started it is not closed it's just opened so you can think about stream as a document so which will have further data which is communicated by the client and the server so streams are actually unidirectional so client and server both will have their own stream so next thing <coughs> so all the other data like the presence information so i'll come back to all these things in subsequent slides so the presence information i don't get why stream is not closed no it is closed at the end when the communication terminates between the uh, client and the server so at that time stream is closed so that's why you can think about stream as a initial document kind of thing whereas your messages are fragments in it so in generally typically in your xml format you will have a root and then subsequent data data you just send the stream tag yeah you will just send the stream tag initially so it will open a connection it will open a connection kind of thing between client and server and then subsequently you will do tls negotiation authentication negotiation and subsequent message transfer so once you are done with all the things the stream is closed so stream is also closed for various other reasons also so that will come a little later so generally so this is the high level information about the stream so the next step in the xmpp world in case of failures and uh, like yeah. server reports it will send a stream or some other yeah so what will happen is say you have opened a stream uh, initiating entity has opened a stream respond responding entity has also sent a stream so initiating entity does something wrong say gives bad authentication details so responding entity will return saying i have closed the stream yeah it it will close so once the uh, responding entity sends this stream so that connection is gone so the initiating entity will terminate so it should terminate so that's how the client implementation should be <coughs> so the next step in the xmpp process is tls negotiation so the xmpp core specification says that this step is optional and it depends upon the uh, vendor vendor server to mandate it so some server say tls is required some server says tls is optional so it depends upon the server and the client so some server may uh, say if you want tls you can go so it's up to client whether to go with the tls or to communicate with the initial connection <coughs> so the tls so once the server sends a stream stream feature so stream features are the features which server supports so it it could be like tls and it could be like you know compression mechanisms it also could be the ssl uh, authentication which are supported by the server so all these things the server will initially send to the client suppose if the tls connection is required the client will then ask the server send the start tls command to the server saying that i will start with the i will start with the tls command do you have any objections or anything so at that time the server responds back to the client saying proceed with the tls or failure or it will close the stream so it depends upon the server and even the request format which is given by the client so once say the server says proceed since the proceed xml 
the existing TCP connection is changed to TLS. So generally, uh, what I can say about is like, say a socket rod TCP connection I have opened, then it is converted to SSL socket connection. So once that is connected to the SSL socket connection, the further the initial stream, whatever the communication happened between the client and server are dropped. Drop means uh, the client and server, uh, uh, that history won't be taken. So a new, new stream would be sent. So client sends a new stream to the server over the TLS. This is for the security implementation. So mainly uh, whatever the communication which has happened over the before the TLS might not be secure. So that's the reason the new stream is opened. So also when the connection is being changed from uh, uh, the ability to change the stream signal. You have to create a new new stream. Pardon? You have to create a new stream. The existing stream will not be Yeah, that is dropped. So that uh, that's what the specification says. Whatever the communication happened might have been attacker, might have gained the access or anything. So we will drop it and we will open a new stream. So that's how it will start. Then what will have to authenticate again? Initially, it wouldn't have authenticated. So the first step is you will send the stream. Server will tell you what on all the features it has, like whether TLS is required or not. If TLS is required, then the uh, client will start a TLS session with the server. So once the TLS session is confirmed with the server, then comes the authentication. So authentication is after TLS. So a new stream is opened. So again, the server will send the stream features. So now uh, a TLS connection has been established. So now the next step is the authenticating with the server. So that is SASL negotiation. So basically, usually many of the servers will uh, provide various authentication mechanism like uh, MD5 digest, plain, etc. Even OAuth is also supported. So it depends upon the server and the client. So some clients may not server, uh, sorry, may, might not support the client's authent I mean, uh, authentication mechanism. So at that time, simply the stream is closed without an error. So sometimes, say, uh, uh, server says plain authentication mechanism is used. So at that time, server, I mean, uh, client will send the authentication data uh, and specify what kind of authentication mechanism it uses. So in this case, in case of plain, the username and password is actually base64 encoded. So you will encode this data and it would be sent to the server. So this is one of the mechanism, plain. So there are many other mechanisms as well. So once this authentication is sent to the server, it, it could be a success or a failure. So failure will lead to the termination of the stream. So success, so once it is a success, so the next step would be binding the resource. Typically in the XMPP, so this JID will have a local part, domain part, and then resource. So this local part is the username, this domain part is the host, so this resource you can think of resource as the client which is using. So in one section, one, one place I can say you are connected to gtalk, uh, gmail talk using say uh, gtalk. So one place you might be using pigeon. So some other place you may be using spark. So at that time, the server will have same client with three different resource. 
So this resource name would be having, say, in the first case, GTOC, and in the second case, Pidgin, third case, Bart. So this is actually very important because if the server, say, there is a group chat or some other uh, group chat, so the message has to be exactly routed to the desired node. It should not go to the all the clients. Even though the username is same, the resource is not same. So in some other case, what you can think about is, say, GTOC is there. GTOC wants the contact list of a user, which they log in using all these three clients. Yeah, and all this. GTOC, only GTOC, at the GTOC, the chat will appear, not on the pigeon and. Uh, no, no, no. What I'm saying is, uh, the server will treat three resources. Are they? So one is GTOC resource. So one is pigeon, and one is uh, say Spark or some other thing. So say your GTOC wants the contact list, which Pidgin and some other client might not be interested because they already have. So they will request the server to send the contact list. So that resource, that contact list should go only to GTOC. It should not go to Pidgin or some other client. So that's why this resource is primarily used. It's for specifically routing the data to a particular node. Yeah. Um, Google has stopped access. Yeah, it is not, yes, correct, correct. Correct, it is no longer using, so it is, a uh, GTOC was replaced by Hangout. Yes. So when it was replaced by Hangout, this XMPP support was dropped. I'm just considering for the example sake. And uh, yeah. who decides the resource name? Is it the server or the client? Resource name, it is decided by usually a client. If client doesn't uh, send a resource name, then server will send all by itself. Is there an authentication mechanism or can the client give any resource name? No, client can give any resource name. So when you are connecting to the server, usually you will specify even the resource name as part of JID. Your username uh, and your domain and resource. Three parameters are specified. If a resource name is not specified, then server will give something like 400, well, some random string it will give. Multiple instances of same resource. No, it can. It won't be. It would be the stream would be thrown as illegal. Say there is an uh, something known as GTOC already registered. So another thing you give again same thing as GTOC. That time it will fail. But we can create two instances of GTOC. Yeah, but I think internally they will give some random IDs or some other thing assigned to it. So that's how I think their implementation is. It might not be the exact same. So. <coughs> and one other question. So yeah. Before this, you talked about MD5 digest and OAuth. Yeah. So what are those? So those are authentication mechanism. How do those be? Uh, it depends. See, open authentication requires the authentic authentication token to be sent from the. Uh, you need to authorize the. I mean, it's a web web based thing say web browser. So your client needs to redirect to a web browser and then get the token and then that token should be a part of your authentication header. So all these implementation are specific to client and server. So whatever mechanism server says, so client may be or may not be able to do it. So uh, general uh, examples are that plain, anonymous, and then uh, explicit. So these are the general ones. So in one case, the server implicitly decides the client. So one case, the username and password is just encrypted over uh, base 64. So in another case, the server will actually send a cipher text to the client. So this client will actually decipher it and send the data to the validate the data and send it to the server. So it depends. It depends upon the server policy as well as the client policy. So, <coughs> so next is the X XML stanzas. So these are uh, XML stanza is one of the important thing. So this is actually the uh, main. So when you have come to this step, you have a you're done with the authentication, you're done with your uh, 
stream negotiation, all the things. So XML stanza is like, there are three main types, like one is message, one is presence, one is info query. So this message is, so message is for sending a message from one node to the another node. So just say there is a server S, it has a client C1, and then client C2. So C1 wants to send a message to C2, so then it will form a XML as specified here. It will say from C1 at domain example.com slash resource to C2 at some domain and with the message body. So this message would be sent to, uh, this message will go to server and based on the uh, like presence and then the offline messaging policy of the server, this message would be routed to the C2. So this from and to attributes are uh, initiating GID and receiving GIDs. So once the stream is open, why do we need the from and to address? Because the stream is already there. See, stream is with the server. Okay. So the from is the initiating entity for server to identify and uh, provide more like which resource it is originating uh, and give all those details. And two, see, you won't be sending data to the server. You would be sending to C2, C3, or some other client. So that's why you require two. Yes. See, all the data is routed by the server. Mm -hmm. So, generally, there would be two streams. One is client to server, server to client. For a client C1. So, for a client C2, it would be the same. C2 to server, server to C2. Any data that goes from C1 to C2, it will go from C1 to server, server to C2. Okay, so, four streams in all. Hmm? Four streams in all. Yeah, it, it depends on the host 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 when both the users are online, then four streams will be there from the server to client. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Four streams will be there. Okay. All the application I think you might have seen do not disturb away available. So XMPP, uh, it is one of the core thing of the XMPP. So with the presence XML, you can specify your status as well as what is your, uh, uh, I mean, uh, what is your current status? Are you away or are you available? Do not disturb. So this is pretty straightforward. So the next is IQ. So this info query is like something like. The presence uh, message goes in a specific limit, like in a time interval. Because presence. Someone is idle or away. Yes. Or yes, correct. Good question. So the thing is, say there is a client C1 server and C2 and C3. C2 and C3 have C1 in their contacts. So say C1 became from available to MA. So at that time, this information would be sent to server. So server will see that C1 is in C3's and C2's contacts. So a XML stanza would be sent to the C3 and C2 saying that uh, C1 is now away. So this is actually pretty much like in our contact list, whenever someone is away, we would be able to see it real time. Because that uh, feed is actually sent by server. Like a push notification. Yeah, it's like push notification. Is that defined by X, uh, XMPP or by the server? Which one? This protocol. This protocol. That I need to send it to people who have... Yeah, it is XMPP. XMPP. 
So that's the presence, extensible messaging and presence protocol. Uh, one other question. So yeah. If a user has multiple resources, and each resource has a different presence, what kind of different status is there? Which one would change? Which one would change? Yeah. Different instances are open. Pardon? If different instances are open for same user. Mm -hmm. So if I change presence here, so what will happen? No, it would be global. Yeah. It would be global. It would be same. So you can see in various clients. So if, even if you are idle in uh, web version of GTalk, you would be shown available because you are online through mobile. Yeah. So that's how it is. But they, they should have some preference if I'm online on web and mobile also. So mm -hmm. it shows preference between the two. So the thing is, uh, server will send all the notification to the client, whether you are active on mobile or whether you are active on uh, web. All the notification will go to the client. So it's up to client to consider which should be the uh, which should be the which one it should consider. See, uh, most one example what I can say is, so in most of the chat application you can see if he is online in mobile or he is online in web application or all those things. So that is based on the resource identification. So at any given point of time whatever the status changes, all the notification will go to the client. So client soul can decide what would be the changes. <coughs> but how would uh, one client know that the other client uh, is away? Right? No, that's what I mean. It's push. So no, but it should be at server level. Because if client suppose he got uh, one message, First BND, then available, then it will continue. So then that bare GID uh, would be there, right? So GID is classified further, like, uh, I mean, like, so for at the resource, at, say GTalk, say at Pidgin. So any changes, whatever happens, it would be sent to the uh, uh, client with the uh, IQ query saying that the presence of this person changed here. So this is primarily like but in a... No, IQ here. Uh, no, it is from, right? It is to the server. So yeah, server, so whatever they... Send to all the clients. Yeah, server will, whatever the message server will send, it would be an IQ. But it will be sent to all the resources. All the resources, yeah. Those are the positions. Yeah. And what they do with the messages is left to the client. Yes. That is not enforced. Yes, messages. correct. Wait, I think it is at the server configuration level. So how server want to determine? Maybe he will be delaying or waiting for some period of time yes. and aggregate and Correct. preferred message will send to the Yes. Group. See in the group chat, say for example in a group chat, so all the resources should be in the one place. Say you are idle in that particular group chat, but you may be active at some other places. So I mean it depends from use case to use case how it should be handled. So it's entirely upon the client to how to show the data which it gets. So this most type of customization will happen in server side or client side? Client side. So client will have the uh, most control. Server will have the policies related to the authentication and who can, uh, see not all the, what kind of client can send messages to which client. So all these policies are enforced by the server. So what would be the subscription pattern? Should C1 get the uh, status updates of C2? It is determined by the server. So all those policies are enforced by the server. So client, whatever the information server gives, how to handle it is at the client level. So this IQ is just like, a, a, for example, like as I told earlier, contact list, or if you want some other specific things from the server to be retrieved. So then you would be giving the IQ query. Say you explicitly want the presence information of a user, so then you will say IQ get me the presence of say uh, this user if he is online or offline. So this IQ is primarily used for that. 
So it's like, a, uh, apart from um, messages and your uh, presence, most other things are handled by the IQ. IQ messages will be sent. Hmm? IQ messages, when it would be sent. Example, Example like uh, for the resource binding I told you, right, initially. So the resource binding makes use of IQ. And even when the server wants to push some messages to the client, like the presence information and other things, so it would be an IQ. And like you said, first login, you get the list of contacts. Yes, that list of the contacts, yes. That is also an IQ. So all these things are IQ. So, any other questions? So, uh, yeah. Uh, if you log into one uh, software like Pigeon, hmm. can I talk to another person logging in from another software? Yeah. Like because the communication. Yeah, it's possible. That's only the client, the XMPP client, can be different. From pitching, you can configure GTOC, but the other person may be using the GTOC client. Is there any plan to change the messaging format apart from XML? Or like, is there any implementation which uses other format like this one? Actually, you can, I mean, one can configure based on this XMPP protocol, but it won't be considered XMPP. But many implementations are there, like so your. Yeah, correct. So, so the we have web sockets. So yeah. How does it come into web sockets versus XMPP? Yes. yes. So web sockets is mainly at your browser level. So this is apart from see, I mean XMPP uh, is like the it is primarily used for not just for the chat. It's for your voice over IP, file transfer, publishing and subscription. So it's the core protocol is initially it was designed for chat. But the entire extensions it has moved over. But your web sockets is primarily for a browser to get a message from the server. It cannot be for your application and other things. And just send a JSON string as well. Which better. which one? It's web socket. Then we can have peer to the communications for Which one? Peer to the communications. The external will be removed. The server for instance if you're open. Which server in web socket. Web socket, yeah. Yeah, the stream concept is not there, but uh, it would be mainly web browser application. You can just send a uh, JSON data lesson using web sockets. Yeah, correct. But it won't be like, uh, you cannot integrate it with all your applications. So it's so a specific purpose. It's a specific purpose. So this is primarily for, uh, you know, voice over IP, file transfer. Then there are a lot of other applications. How Yeah, there are a lot of implement, uh, implementation like OpenFire and uh, Ejabird, etc. So XMPP has something known as XCP. So the XCP specifies the various modules. So the core XMPP is the ex stanza processing and this thing. So this XCP will have the extended set like publisher, subscription, and then uh, file transfer. All these are there. So you can look into any implementation like OpenFire or uh, HRBird or OpenFire is a Java based, which I particularly use. Yeah. So you can take the source code, it's an open source project, so you can customize with it. Is IRC based on No, no, IRC is separate. It's a different protocol. So theoretically speaking, if I wanted to have only uh, browser protocols, I mean browser based clients, hmm. can I still use WebSockets to send XMPP instances? No, WebSockets is different. So WebSockets... Uh, so basically, uh, I have to implement an XMPP server. Right? Okay, yeah. So, so can I use WebSockets to finally send that to the client? The communication part. Communication yeah. part. So you want to implement a server or client. So how, how does XMPP work? You need a server, right? XMPP yeah, you server. need an XMPP server. And you also need an XMPP client. So you need both the things. So is it theoretically possible to finally send it when you are writing your own XMPP server and client? Uh, use web sockets? I'm not sure about the server part, but client I'm not sure. I mean, server is something, the request response pattern and all, you need to look into it. I mean, 
opening the socket and I don't think using web sockets you can create an XMPP server. But XMPP client, I'm not sure. is proprietary. Okay. So, so they have moved to proprietary. But we are still even able to use that Google Tag. Google yeah, Google that Google is, Google. I think, uh, because of their deprecation policy, I think we are able to, we are able to connect it. Yes, so they have some policies. So after some, some time it will stop. Yeah, some time it will stop. Yeah. It was stopped in May, last year. This year? This year. Mm -hmm. May stopped. And Android Android is, uh, like, replacing all, yeah, all the, the developer the service itself will stop this. Uh, April. Yeah. But why did they move? Is there any justification? Uh, Primarily because of Android. Because Amazon was just ripping off Android. They're making it into separate proprietary services. So they'll, you know, and also it's like you know their own custom mm -hmm. uh, solution, right? They won't integrate everything with Google Plus. In USA, everyone was using uh, buying a VIP box, mm -hmm. connecting it to internet, and using the VIP box instead of their phone service. Okay. So Google was losing money on that VIP box because that was not Android or something. So they could still do it, right? huh? They don't have to use like data for that. The Google Voice is based on XCP. And people were uh, using that. And uh, Google Voice was free, basically. You could call anyone in the US for free. It's still free, right? Yes. And that's why they are stopping it. They are not making money on it. They couldn't find a way to make permission from Google to. So you're saying Google Voice is going to be stopped? Google Voice is going to stop, and uh, everything that Google has, uh, the communications based on XMPP are going to stop. We stop this. But Android also has voice and audio. It's free. Yeah. But also, can you call any language? Yes. No. Uh, I don't know. On the web, at least you can. I don't know if, if, if it's still using it. Even in India, even in India, no, not not in India, in the US, in Canada, in your browser. Yeah, but that's still free. 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 So in, in, your setting, in India, you can call it. In your setting, just to change your country to US, you will get the option of calling people, calling numbers. I can't show it there. It is in this laptop. So, any other As questions? As on the HDMI out and there's no converter. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.